Hi, I'm Michael. This is Lessons from the Screenplay. When we go to see a horror film, we usually have some idea of what to expect. The common tropes and cliches have been so well documented, they're even referenced in horror films themselves. You should never say who's there. Don't you watch scary movies? It's a death wish. But the horror films that stick with us are often the ones that provide a unique twist on the character's perspective of the horror. Like a slasher film told through the eyes of teenagers on the night of Halloween. Or a monster film following truck drivers in space, where escape is nearly impossible and no one can hear you scream. Or a found footage film told through the point of view of documentary filmmakers. And with each of these different perspectives comes new ways of telling the story. Get Out follows in this tradition, providing an unfamiliar perspective on the horror. But in this case, it's not some exotic setting or a filmmaking gimmick. It's simply that the protagonist is black. Taking inspiration from the 1967 classic Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, in which a white woman takes her black fiancé to meet her parents, Jordan Peele said, One of the reasons that film, I think, was so effective in its discussion with race is because it started with a, a situation that was universal. Take the race out of it, everybody can relate to the fear of meeting your potential in-laws for the first time. So at some point I had a revelation that that was also the way to get in to this film. Beginning with a situation that is universal ensures that an audience comes into a story with a certain amount of personal experience and empathy. But it's the specifics of the characters put into a situation that make a story interesting. And what impresses me most about Get Out is how Jordan Peele uses the specifics of the protagonist to unlock new storytelling techniques. So today I want to look at the film's unique method of building tension, to see how it takes advantage of its premise to set up a surprising twist and examine the way it creates a feeling of isolation while subverting a horror trope. Let's take a look at Get Out. Most horror films are built on tension. The characters are put into a situation where they're in harm's way, and we know it's only a matter of time before the danger gets to them. But in Get Out, the dangerous situation isn't some alien planet or a spooky house. It's a weekend in the country with rich white people. You said I was the first black guy you ever did. Yeah, so what? Yeah, so it's his uncharted territory for him. You know, I don't want to get chased off the lawn with a shotgun. There have been plenty of films where a suburban neighborhood is the victim of horror, but rarely is it ever the source. So as Chris and Rose arrive at her parents' place, the audience is already unsure of what to expect. Our biggest worry is that Chris might actually get chased off the lawn with a shotgun. But we quickly see that that won't be the case. You call me Dean and you're hungry, <laughs> my man. <laughs> As rather than make Rose's parents obviously disapproving of Chris, Jordan Peele decides to build tension in a more subtle way. By the way, I, I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. Best president in my lifetime, hands down. While they're clearly trying to be welcoming, the parents do have moments that are a bit, as Jordan Peele says, racially clumsy. So how long has this been going on, this, this thing? <laughs> Nothing major and with no clear malice intended, but enough to provide some basic tension. With your frame and your genetic makeup, if you really pushed your body, you'd be a beast. However, as we see more moments of the family and their friends reacting to Chris's blackness, Oh, not bad. Tension continues to build. Jeremy. In this way, real life racial tensions are used to help build the suspense, making the unease we feel more layered and complex. But in many ways, the more overtly disturbing characters are the few black people Chris does encounter. When he reaches out to try to make a connection with them, the interactions are off-putting. She is lovely, isn't she? Rose? Yes, she is. One of a kind, top of the line, a real doggone keeper. <laughs> right. Some are particularly unsettling. I do something. This method of building tension is effective partially because we've never seen it used in a horror film this way. Get out. And it's unlocked simply because of the specifics of the protagonist and his situation. But this is not the only technique made available because of the specifics of the protagonist. Throughout the script, Jordan Peele utilizes a unique way of establishing trust. 
Chris's fear going into the weekend is that Rose's parents will react negatively to their relationship, operating from a place of ignorance. But once he gets there, he instead sees there are moments where they're actually aware of the potential concerns he may have. Come on, I get it. White family, black servants, it's a total cliche. I wasn't gonna take you there. Well, you didn't have to, believe me. <laughs> this awareness assuages some of Chris's fears and makes us feel like maybe we can trust them. The same technique is used during the party scene. After interacting with a number of guests who seem obsessed with Chris's blackness, I do know Tiger. He encounters Jim, the art dealer. Ignorance. Who seems to actually be aware of people's behavior and the dynamics at play. They mean well, but they have no idea what real people go through. Once again, this makes us feel like we can trust him. As Jordan Peele says, He is an apparent ally to Chris. He understands that people focusing on race or color, uh, there, there's an ignorance to them. And when we see that this trust has been misplaced, it makes the reveal during the auction scene that much more compelling. But the best example of using awareness to establish trust is with the Rose character. Originally, Jordan Peele was going to tell the audience early on that she was involved in the family's plot. But then, as he says, And at some point I realized, wait a second, if you could pull some Kaiser Soze shit, why would you not pull some Kaiser Soze shit? So that at that point, it's like, okay, all right, we're going to take this up one notch. If I can do the impossible and I can hide the fact that this woman who is literally bringing him into harm's way, if I can hide the fact that she's in on it, then I'll, I'll have a really great revelation. When we meet Chris and Rose, it's immediately clear they're in love. But the thing that really helps us trust, or at least want to trust Rose, is how much she empathizes with Chris's experience. Throughout the film, Rose is acutely aware of how people, including her family, are treating Chris differently. The scene where this is conveyed most explicitly is after the awkward dinner their first night at her parents' place. What is his problem? He's never treated any of my boyfriends that way. Ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, and then my dad was uh, my man stuff. My man, my man. I don't think he's ever heard that or said it, and now he just, it's all he says. Jordan Peele says of this scene, You know, I was sort of adding this idea of Rose's continued wokeness because the fact that she's more turned up about this than he is, the audience, I think, subconsciously presumes that if she was in on it, she wouldn't be uh, wiling out like this. Chris has to bring her back down to earth. So I, I think she wins our trust uh, in this scene as, as well as his. Once again, this is a storytelling mechanism that is only unlocked because of the specificity of the protagonist and the situation he's in. But taking it a step further, because the story is so unfamiliar, a black protagonist and a horror film who ends up trapped by a white family set on stealing the bodies of African Americans, there are even meta-level elements at play that aid in hiding Rose's true intentions. I knew in my heart that anybody who's seeing a movie in a wide release in America would have to think there's no way Universal Studios would allow the one good white person in this film to also be evil. There's no way they would do that. But they did. You know I can't give you the keys, right, babe? And the result is a twisted reveal about the true nature of Rose that underscores her psychopathic nature. You were one of my favorites. In this final act of the film, when it seems like all hope is lost, we might find ourselves wishing that there was someone, anyone, to come save our protagonist. But here, Jordan Peele subverts a horror trope by reversing our desire for help to arrive. A cabin in the woods, outer space, a secluded house in the country, all great ways to make sure your characters can't run away easily. The nearest house is across the lake. It's total privacy. But part of what makes a character feel isolated is knowing that there is no one around to save them. Such is the case for Chris, as there's no one nearby he can call for help. Not even the last hope of most characters in horror films. I am two seconds away from calling the police. During the sequence toward the beginning of the film, when Chris and Rose are driving to her parents' place, they hit a deer. They call the police, who respond to the situation. But the focus soon changes from the deer to Chris. Sir, can I see your license, please? Wait, why? Yeah, I have state ID. No, 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 he wasn't driving. 
I didn't ask who was driving, I asked to see his ID. We see that the mere presence of Chris in this area makes this officer suspicious. This suggests that if local law enforcement get involved at any point in the story, it's probably not going to go Chris's way. So as the story progresses and Chris's situation gets worse, instead of wanting the police to come help, I'm calling the police! <laughs> there are moments when we realize their arrival would be the last thing we want to happen. So of course, it does, at the worst possible moment. As Chris, covered in blood, kneels over a dying rose, siren lights flash on the side of their heads. The scene doesn't look good. Chris turns towards them, raising his hands. Rose smiles again and pleads with the approaching officers. Help me! Without a word being spoken, we know the implications of this situation, which is what makes the reveal of Rod so cathartic. Chris! Once again, the specificity of the protagonist and his situation are taken advantage of, as the film subverts a horror trope and provides yet another fun surprise. I mean, I told you not to go in that house. Good films are able to find fresh ways of telling their stories, surprising us while simultaneously giving us exactly what we want. And as old storytelling techniques become familiar and uninspiring, the stories we tell and the ways we tell them have to evolve. Over the last few years, it's become clear that audiences are eager for new perspectives. Get Out brings a new perspective to a classic genre. It demonstrates the value in mining the unique elements of a narrative for new ways of telling a story and reveals that the struggles of a specific protagonist can resonate universally, as we can all empathize with a situation where you simply need to get out. When researching and writing these videos, I try to find ways to be efficient with my time. So if I find myself stuck in LA traffic, I love being able to listen to Audible. Audiobooks are a great way to turn idle time into a productive time when you can learn something new. And what I love about Audible is that they have a great selection of books on writing. For example, they have Story by Robert McKee, which is definitely a book I recommend you check out if you're interested in screenwriting. It talks about a lot of great fundamentals, and I've used it in several of my videos. And when you start a 30-day trial with Audible, your first audiobook is free. So if you go to audible.com LFTS or text LFTS to 500-500, you can download the audiobook for story today, and it is yours to keep. Once again, that's audible.com slash LFTS, or text LFTS to 500-500. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed this video. I just redid my Patreon page with a new video for you to check out. So head over to my Patreon page to watch that, and if you feel like supporting the channel, that would be greatly appreciated. I also want to take a moment to thank Jeff Goldsmith for letting me use audio from his podcast, The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith. He's done a ton of great interviews with screenwriters, and he has a digital magazine called Backstory, which you can check out at backstory.net. Both of them are great resources for screenwriters, and you should definitely check them out. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.